This is the hardest part for Chuck to be to be appropriate for one minute. Mm -hmm. it's a hard time. Very difficult. All right, we're going now. We're going live. Good afternoon. My name is Connie McLaughlin, and I'm with the MUI unit at the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on the mystery of the unknown PPI. Sounds like a Scooby-Doo episode, doesn't it? <laughs> um, we have four really great speakers with us today. Um, so before I introduce them, I'm going to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, many of you have been on our webinars in the past, and you know how to use our system. Basically, if you have questions, the easiest thing to do is to type them into the questions box. We will allow for questions at the end of this session. If we do not get to everyone's questions, we will email you after the webinar. Um, if you have any problems connecting to the GoToWebinar, sometimes it's easier to disconnect and reconnect than it is to uh, try calling and, and getting the sound quality better. Um, we do have someone in our office who will be checking the sound quality throughout the uh, throughout our session. Um, in terms of the CEUs for today's uh, class, anyone that's watching or participating in this live and they're um, watching either in a group and sending in a group attendant sheet or if they're just uh, on the system, the GoToWebinar system, participating individually, we'll get one hour of continuing professional development emailed to you uh, within 30 days of this webinar. If you are viewing it as a group and you want to turn in a attendance sheet, uh, please email it to either uh, myself or Deb Forrest in our office. And please don't uh, wait longer than 30 days to do that. So we ask that you complete those forms and send them in to us within 30 days to get credit. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, during the webinar or afterwards, please uh, refer to our phone number here, 614-995-3810. And at the back of the presentation, we have the contact information for all our presenters today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters. Uh, we figured between the five of us, we have about 130 some odd years of experience uh, working in the developmental disabilities field. and um, so we're very honored to have these four presenters today talking about something that's really important, and that's protecting the individual's um, funds and also property. So uh, I want to introduce Jerry Cannon from the uh, Cuyahoga County Board. He's the forensic auditor there. Sorry. Hi, Jerry. Hello. <laughs> Next, we have Chuck Davis, the regional manager with uh, the department here. Hello. And Carol Easton, our investigator. Hi. And of course, Scott Phillips, our assistant deputy director. Good afternoon. So I'm going to turn it over to these usual suspects, and Chuck Davis is going to get us started with our presentation. Uh, the first thing we're going to start off, we're just talking about the objectives real quick. Um, just, I have some data that I'm going to go over, and then uh, we're going to have uh, Jerry and uh, Carol talk about some red flags, investigations, contributing factors uh, that go along with the investigations when we have an unknown PPI and some of the issues we've seen with uh, multiple investigations. Uh, kind of exploring uh, and coming up with and determining who the PPI is, uh, even if it's unknown who they might be, even though we may not be able to prove it. Uh, some good case reviews, uh, prevention plan with Scott Phillips, and also talking about uh, personal funds review with uh, Jerry and Carol. Excellent. And I wanted to also point out that the slides you're seeing here today are, are listed in your handout section of the GoToWebinar, and you should have received an email copy as well. But if you haven't downloaded it, feel free to, to uh, do that now. Um, we just have a few slides with some data on it. I just wanted to review it quickly before uh, Carol and and Jerry start to present some of the, the really good information that they have today. Uh, the one thing that I noticed when I was looking at this is uh, actually 2015 is the lowest uh, as far as how many investigations that uh, 
were made for misappropriation uh, since 2009. And I think that might be because uh, after, you know, we've been doing this training for quite a while as far as misappropriation, MUI definitions over the state. And I think people are starting to put uh, better preventive measures in because uh, as you'll see, uh, the unknown PPI is almost 60% of the uh, MUIs that are substantiated in the state of Ohio which means that there's a lot of systems issues that we've seen over the years that I think people are improving on. So I think the better systems we have in place, the lower our numbers may be as far as uh, making allegations and having uh, a misappropriation uh, investigation needed. When we break down the, the, the numbers for 2015, uh, like I said just a little bit ago, 59% of our substantiated cases uh, as an unknown PPI. And what that means is we know there's theft, we just don't know who stole it. And that can be uh, a lot of different issues. It can be the lockbox, it can be medications, it can be food and laundry and th laundry detergent, things like that that come up missing. Uh, we know it's stolen, we know it's not being thrown away, it's not misplaced. There's actual theft and we can prove it with the investigation, we just can't prove who stole it. And some of that goes back to what sort of systems are in place. Uh, and I think this this graph actually, you know, proves what we're talking about. Even though our numbers went down in 2015 as far as how many misappropriation cases were filed in 2015, uh, as you can see, the number has uh, continued to go up, and it went up quite a bit in 2015 uh, when we are looking at uh, an unknown PPI. Uh, it's nice to see that the employees went down, and I think that's another um, uh, uh, another way to prove that uh, we got maybe a little bit better systems in place that way. Maybe there's some follow-up, but there is a concern, maybe kind of wise, why the number for unknown PPI uh, is going up. I, the one thing I would like to suggest for the county board folks, and even if you're doing an analysis at a large agency, is when you're doing your analysis or your stakeholder information, look at drilling down at some of. Uh, your information when it comes down to your theft cases. So how many of your theft cases with an unknown PPI have to do with a lockbox? Did it occur in the home when staff was supposed to be there? Is it the breaking and entering? Uh, a lot of times we'll see cases where it seems as if the individuals are only gone a couple hours on an activity and that's when the breaking and entering come in, uh, multiple people with keys, and I think Jerry and Carol will talk about causing determining factors, but please, when you're doing your analysis as a stakeholder, I would really drill down on the unknown PPI on those type of cases. And then some of the items that we see taken, uh, the top three actually are cash, property, and medications, uh, but we also see other things such as the iPads and the cell phones uh, and the gaming systems. Those are hard to track. Uh, obviously, it's really important. Uh, to have good documentation and inventory for those kind of things. Uh, food stamps and groceries are pretty easy to steal, especially groceries. If I'm doing the grocery shopping alone instead of taking individuals with me, I can. it's very easy to put some of it in my car and just some of it uh, in the home where the individuals are served. So we want to look at those kind of items. Uh, clothes, furniture, um, uh, those are kind of easy still. Sometimes folks are moving from place to place and I've actually seen where we're storing someone's furniture in the garage and then like sofas and tables, all that kind of stuff disappears. That's amazing that something that large can disappear and no one saw a U-Haul truck or a pickup truck and we have no idea where that, you know, and nobody had, you know, paid attention to what was in the garage for two or three weeks and they can't remember when's the last time they saw the sofa or the small appliances. So we have a variety of items, but as you can tell here, our number one is cash and then property and medications. And to be honest, uh, all three of those things are systems issues that if you have a good system in place, uh, you'll be able to catch it sooner than later, and that will assist the individuals uh, with having less stolen. And if you're an agency, that's less that you have to reimburse uh, because you have a good system in place that can catch these things uh, at an early time. And then some of the uh, reasons for the increase with an unknown PPI, um, obviously, we have staff who sometimes we don't know their personal life. Uh, I just talked to an IA who, once he was investigating the uh, PPI, he could tell that there were drug issues right away uh, with the way she appeared, the way she was uh, handling herself in the interview. I think we see things like that. Uh, lots of people have access uh, to the money, to the medications. 
A lot of people have uh, multiple keys. Uh, we actually found a group home not too long ago where there was a box of keys, and that's how they were passing them out to the staff. So it just sat there uh, with almost 100 keys. So anybody that needed so if you lose a key, no big deal. There's a box of keys. We grab another key. So everybody has access to come and go as they please in the house. So uh, there are some of those kind of systems issues uh, uh, Jerry and Carol will address uh, with their presentation today. Thank you, Chuck. Now we're going to turn it over to Carol. Well, what's in it for the served individuals? When their money is for property, medications are taken. Um, you know, we need to identify if there is a, a, a systemic issue here. Um, is it just a one-time thing, or is there a problem with the way that we're handling all these things? So I think that a thorough investigation into the situation to identify the PPI um, is a great thing, and we, that's what we need to do because the restitution should come from that PTI if at all possible. Otherwise, the agencies are a lot of times held liable and it could mean a lot of money depending on how long the, the thievery has been going on. But more important, I think, than that is the, you know, we need to recognize that there is a true emotional toll taken on a lot of the individuals that they, you know, trusted these people, their, their possessions, their money has been stolen by somebody, and it's just like if you or I had a break-in in our house, you kind of feel violated. You feel like, oh my gosh, who are these people and can I trust anybody? And so that's also a part of the investigation is to try to make sure that they understand that, you know, we are trying our best to figure this out and the prevention of it again from happening again. And that is mainly the focus, is try to identify so that we can prevent it from happening again. You know, a lot of times our, our individuals have been served by in staff that have worked with them for a very long time before they start becoming thieves. And there's been cases where the individuals just simply do not want to believe that that person could have done that to them. You know, they've, an individual whose parents are deceased and the staff has been taking them home for the last, you know, several years for Thanksgiving and Christmas, they, they become part of their family. And that can be devastating to that individual to know that that person has been taking a lot of money from them or stealing their um, income and from underneath their nose. And many times individuals with large monthly benefits are those who are targeted or those that um, work at a job and make uh, you know minimum wage or above and so they've got a lot of money rolling in and maybe they live in a congregate setting so they, their expenses are not as um, large as if they lived by themselves. And what's in it for the provider? You know, the unknown PPI investigation, like I said, reveal, may reveal a systemic issue. And what we want to do then is to figure it out so that we can keep it from happening again. And I believe that many, many, many of these are due to provider um, compliance with do, following their own policies and procedures for reconciling their books. Um, we have, if we have found, and I just was reviewing a case where the provider agency reviewed monthly all of the expenditures, the receipts, the petty cash, the logs, and the bank statements, and reconciled those. And they caught somebody after one month, and I think the person got maybe six or seven hundred dollars from four individuals. But think about that. If that had gone on for a year, even six months, um, and here we are, we've got somebody that's been stealing that much every single month, and you know, you times that out, and that's a good deal of money that, you know, depending on who that perpetrator is, may or may not be the one responsible to pay that back. 
um, when we get into the court system and everything, they, you know, a lot of times will have order restitution, but many times we don't go there or we don't get that order, and then the provider agency is the one that gets stuck doing it. Um, as Chuck was saying, that, you know, we've had a lot of issues with the keys. Um, you know, there are multiple people having keys. That there are multiple homes that are keyed with the same key. Um, not only the outside, but also the um, inside where the meds and, and money are kept at a, in a locked room. And so that is always something that should never be done. Yes, when we're, you know, going out and interviewing the staff in these homes where, the, where there's been missing money, um, sometimes it does send a good um, message to them that we are taking this seriously and maybe just by looking into something will maybe prevent it from happening again. But as I mentioned, the, the agency checks and balances um, on a frequent basis are going to be the thing that deter many of these misappropriations. The investigative agent, their role is to prevent this from happening again, trying to figure out who that person was um, that, that has done this. And, you know, we've got people that come forward and tell us, oh, I have, I know this person has done this, or they may have told their administrators at the agency, hey, I think so-and-so has been stealing money. And we've had cases where the administrators just don't listen to that. They don't want to believe it. They think that that staff person is doing a great job. And they, there have been also instances where it's gone unreported to the county board, where the money's just been replaced, and no one's ever gone in there to look at the situation. And in that case, and in many cases like it, there are thousands, tens of thousands of dollars that end up being missing at the end of those cases. Also, the investigative agent wants to, throughout their investigation, assist in with law enforcement. If there is a, a person that we can't identify, we want to help them to do the audits. That's what Mr. Cannon, Jerry Cannon is a friend and he has assisted many, many, many cases to go forward and be, be prosecuted um, because he will do an audit on that and show exactly what was taken and when and what is not being able to be accounted for. And so we want to make sure that we are developing good interpersonal and also interagency relationships with everyone as we're um, going through these investigations. <coughs> Jerry's going to do some red flags. Carol and I are going to, we're going to do these red flags. We're going to go kind of quickly. There's a lot of them, but you've got them in your, in your packet for, uh, for reference. We'll be uh, pulling in some examples as we do these things. Uh, next slide is sometimes we see large amounts of cash. Uh, being out in the field where that, it just didn't need to be there. Uh, it's a temptation to the staff to do their own payday loan thing. A provider should establish an amount in the field, uh, a maximum amount. It's 30 to $50 or something, whatever the typical spending for the month uh, would be because that's how much the provider is, is, has exposure to. And the more money that's out there, the more likely, uh, if it's staff that's stealing or whoever's stealing, if they know where it's at and they need it, they're gonna, they'll remember that. Uh, some people think that we got to keep the bank statements. We've got to keep the amounts in the bank below 1500 so we don't uh, violate the Medicaid maximum amount. But bring it to the cash, putting it on a, a gift card, whatever you're doing with it, it still all counts toward that, that test. So the bank is a safe place for it, and you just need to get it spent down below those, those amounts. And the team needs to plan if someone is higher earning, it's going to keep happening over and over. So you need to do some longer range planning. Uh, to allow the, so you can't keep that money down. <coughs> weekly allowances, we see that the ISP sometimes will have a, a weekly allowance to be out there and then providers will decide, well, that's not enough or that's too much and they'll just on their own change it. They should at least know that the, uh, the team know that they're changing the amounts 
why they're doing it, because maybe someone's money is accumulating, or because they have the, the, some other some other reasons. They, they maybe they want to do some other activities or something. But you need to that's that's your base point is the the allowance amount in the ISB. Sometimes we see utilities paid. Occasionally I see it where they pay twice a month on a utility, which doesn't make any sense to me. In the past, what we've seen is that they were probably paying the right utility some and then paying somebody else's utility the second time. Uh, they pay sometimes in smaller amounts, even amounts. It just doesn't make sense because if you don't pay the whole amount of utility, you're going to get a, a service charge, and that certainly sort of doesn't sound right to the individual serve. <laughs> we've even seen a, a situations where the, the certain individual moves out of, of a setting and a staff mover moves in on that person's deposit, and they'll probably leave the utility zone in there that the certain individual's name too. Uh, it's just all the time. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. And when we catch it, it's just not a pretty sight. Uh, dining out, they um, uh, sometimes a certain individual. We're using the term SI here for certain individual. Uh, the records uh, show they're eating out a lot, but yet we don't see the food uh, volume of food in the house declining. Uh, in Cuyahoga County, we just use a number of seven dollars fifty cents a day to maybe uh, eight fifty a day. It's just a target number for a target setting for the cost of food inside the, the dwelling. Just as a target, if it gets to be more than that, we get interested in it, and we we, we want to look to see is staff eating, uh, just what's what's going on there. Uh, the provider, the staff, or the provider should pay for the staff's expenses, whatever they're outing. Uh, if it's a long-term vacation, they're going to Disneyland or, or they're going to California or something, that might be an ex exception that, that you need to uh, plan that and, and have a, have a uh, team discussion on how you would cover some staff's expenses then. But if they're eating out, the eating activity is for the server individual and the movies and stuff like that, that that's, uh, should use uh, somebody's money other than the server individual's money for that. Uh, next one is phone expenses. Uh, they should the individual should pay the uh, equal amounts in the congregate setting of the base charges. If someone is in the home is doing long distance, some of the certain individuals, they need to keep a log or it needs to be identified in their their ISP as to wh who they have a relative that they're calling out of, out of state or in a different area. Uh, it, it, but it should not be the staff that's of course using the long distance or that the providers using it for their automated phone system for their for their time clock or that that needs to be expensive would go to the provider. Uh, they need to keep again uh, this long distance logs and uh, as we mentioned, cable TV uh, are the movies that are being paid for on a pay per view are they for the certain individual's benefit or are they for the staff's benefit? You know that's 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 the way it is. And the movies are the are the movies appropriate that that's Coming into the to the certain individual's home for all the individuals, if it's if it's not appropriate for all, and it is for some, then it needs to be specified, and they have a different way of look, watching those movies somewhere other than in the common area. Uh, but again, if it's for staff, that's that staff problem. Uh, food stamp card. We'll go to that the direction card. Ohio direction card. Uh, the benefit received. Uh, sometimes we we've seen it where that someone did not had not been uh, set up for food stamps, but a staff member made up some numbers and went down and got food stamps for the individual. And then, of course, the provider didn't know about it. Uh, you got to watch for those things because that's its own theft. And food stamp, food stamp uh, theft will get you on the, uh, you know, bar you from working our field. Uh, that that's one of the, the disqualifiers. Uh, employee uses the food stamp. They're not going to keep a ledger typically. Uh, you know that that's. That's why you got to track the food stamps on a ledger. If you get the report off the EBT card, then it'll give you a ledger showing the time and day that where it was used. And of course, those can be used in prosecution also, and identifying who did it because typically they're on a camera when they when they use those cards. Uh, the cash benefit of the card, we if someone is on especially on SSI and they're at an age range, which I believe it's more than 18 and less than 62. Uh, those those they, those uh, ages might be a little different, but it set the DCS workers' uh, discretion as to whether they would give the approval to be the money or the the, the card. Uh, if you have a good tracking system on your finances, it's always going to be easier to track that that money if it's an actual money that's given to the individual. 
that money should be direct deposited into a checking account for the individual. And that's the way it should be explained to the DSAS is that the card is just really hard to keep track of, especially in a congregate setting, to make sure they get full benefit of the, of the food stamps. <coughs> um, the banking, checking, uh, cash ledgers, all money coming out of the bank, all cash coming out of the bank should go on a cash ledger. And on the cash ledger, you explain that's where you use the money to go to Target, you go to, to for outings, you for allowances, for whatever. That that's so money. All cash coming out of the bank should go on some kind of a cash ledger and track that way. Uh, groceries and supplies. Uh, staff may be eating. These are problems we found in the past where staff is eating the individual's food or overbuying, as uh, initially was talked about, that and just leaving some in the trunk of the car to go home to their home. Or they actually overcook. They make enough food for the individuals for their dinner and enough for their own family when they when they go back home. So, you know, it's just uh, it shouldn't be. We we've, we've seen where where staff or, or uh, would buy larger amounts of laundry detergent, toilet paper, clean supplies, and they had to buy more and more during the month because they someone was taking it out the back door to their own homes. Uh, that's that's the way you you got to watch the. Uh, Watch those supplies. Gift store and prepaid cards. Yeah, you know, uh, staff sometimes they'll buy that they think, again, trying to hide money from the, uh, on the test, the SSI test or the Medicaid test. They'll go out and buy gift cards. Every gift card, you got to keep it on a separate ledger for that card. And every time you use that card, you need to staple the receipt to that ledger because that'll show the declining balance. It'll show how the money was used and it'll show how much is left on the card. There are a lot of work, and it's just, uh, it's better if you don't don't try to handle your money that way, is my experience. Um, home parties, we've seen uh, Amway parties, Tupperware parties, jewelry parties, where that the provider staff gets the benefit of hosting the party and then uses a certain individual's money to purchase stuff at the party. There's a conflict there, and that, that's, that's just not appropriate, and that's, uh, It'll just get you in trouble, uh, and, and so it's uh, it's better if you don't host those kind of parties. Has been my experience uh, because staff could use undue, undue influence on the individuals. Other red flags we've seen uh, the direct care. Direct care um, we're talking about. I'm sorry. This is life insurance. Uh, the beneficiary of life insurance policy typically is a funeral home. If it's if it's a family member that's of that certain individual, that that might be appropriate. Uh, but the the next point is that the paying the life insurance premiums, and it could be that the family has said, we really want them to pay this life insurance premium, but it should not diminish the standard of living, and that take away the that person that certain individual's ability to do outings, and, and that's that's something that should be negotiated. That's something that should be uh, if the provider themselves is, is arranging the, the life insurance. They really need to be sensitive to that, that they that they not overburden the person with the, with the monthly payment. The two, every, a, life, a burial, true burial policy is going to have two elements to it. The funeral home is going, age funeral home is going to be the beneficiary. That can be redistributed. If, if the case the funeral home goes out of business, or the family moves, or whatever, you can re, you can move it to a different funeral home as the beneficiary if it's a real burial policy. And the other big word has to be the word irrevocable. Irrevocable. Stay with us. Oh, yeah. say, it, say it loud, say it proud. The, if it's not irrevocable, if the insurance company, if the individual quits making the payments, then the insurance will go away. If it's irrevocable, whatever they paid in, at least that amount of money is going to be available when they pass. The other thing, if it's not irrevocable, if the if the uh, life insurance company or the funeral home that it's assigned to goes out of business or it gets bought by another entity. They may not have to bring over the policy, but irrevocable is just what the word says. They have to buy the, the, the debts with the assets. Uh, they go there, and again, it may be, like I said, that one time payments, until it's completely paid up, at least they've got the amount of money they paid in to be there for their final cost. So that's, you want to watch for that word. All right, you got gambling trips. Yeah, we've had some of those for that they, uh, Somebody decided the certain individual wanted to go gambling, whether they wanted to or not. And we've had different different ways we've heard them tricking in the individuals to go. One telling them that they had bowling 
at, at, a, at a casino and knowing well they didn't have. Well, the guy, when he got back, he was not real happy that they used his money to go to this casino in Detroit to find out there was no bowling alley. So, you know, the other thing is it's a real temptation for staff all of a sudden to decide they won rather than the certain individual, no matter whose money they used. So if they're going with family, that's kind of different. But if it's a paid staff, uh, uh, it needs to be there's some extra oversight of that thing, and it's just a, it's a real slippery slope. So it's, it's going to bite you. So uh, if they do go on trips, and sometimes you have trips where they pay equal portions for the bus, but it may be that because staff members getting in the the trip up, they get a free ride out of this thing. Uh, we would think that the the that expense of that free ride should be pushed off to each of the individuals that go. That if it's a $60 uh, normal trip to go and the staff gets a free ride out of it, then some portion of that $60 for their free ride should go to the served individuals. Uh, if four served individuals go, they should pay a fourth of the common expenses. Uh, we're talking if they do a hotel, if they do, again, the bus, if they do whatever the transportation. Uh, their food would be unique to, to whatever they eat, but everything else should be equally portioned out. And if they're making a bigger trip, as I mentioned, uh, Disneyland, uh, uh, going somewhere out and they're with family, it's, 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 we would encourage the family to get individual receipts so that the family just gets in the same lockstep as what the providers do, bring back receipts for the money you spend. But if it's the certain, if it's the staff going, then it, there needs to be a pre-approval from the team. Uh, I think in the past, was the, the, what we're seeing is that before they go, you budget the thing out and Everybody agrees to it, and you're not spending money they don't have, and you receipted, everything is receipted uh, if, if you're covering a portion of the staff's expenses, but everything has to be understood before they leave, and then you follow that and don't spend any money, extra money. If they get there and decide they want to do something else, like I say, it needs to be pre-planned. Next was charitable contributions. Uh, <laughs> over the years, I've had providers say, well, we're a nonprofit. How come a certain individual can't contribute to our nonprofit like other people do? And again, it's called undue influence, and it's it's a it's a real bad practice to get into. Uh, if in fact, uh, if in fact it's going to be done, I would think it'd be in the ISP before it's done. If an individual is giving money to a church on a routine basis, uh, that's a good thing to have in the ISP too, because if families involved, they'll they'll, they'll all understand what what's going to happen there. We have a, a bad example. We have to do enough examples. The bad example is in one audit, I, I pulled a, asked for a receipt on a $700 with, uh, transaction. It was a letter from a, a church, and it says, thank you so much. Though we've never met you, we'll put this money to good use. We have a building program going on. And so I thought, that's just not right. And so <laughs> I figured that out myself. And so a after I left that audit, I went and called the pastor and I said, do you know this person, which is the servant individual? And he goes, no, I don't think I know who that is. And so I named off the house manager and a couple of the work, people working in the house. Oh, yeah, they come to our church. You know, well, that didn't work out too well for that provider. And the poor minister goes, oh, no, I've already spent it. We're going to pay it back? I said, no, I think the provider will take care of that. And the provider did. The provider's not real happy about it, but they paid the money back. Yep. Carol, other examples or anything else that we're um. pushing here? Okay. While she's looking, we'll do the, the yeah, no, I don't. corporate expenses. Again, gas for the corporate uh, uh, vehicle or for the direct care person span, that's just not right. You know, that that red flags. And if you see that kind of stuff, they need to be paying for their own gas. Mm -hmm. And they need to, I would suggest they guard buying items at a gas store because it's going to look like gas on a receipt. Uh, the, the fax machine is in the house, the internet connection, unless individual server individuals can use the internet, and then that's a, that's, a, that's a corporate problem. That's a corporate expense in my mind. Now, kind of setting uh, the potential, uh, they should share these expenses only for the ones who can actually use the service. If, if, they, if they can't use the internet, then they shouldn't be paying, in my mind, should be paying a portion of the internet cost. Uh, office supplies, equipment in the office, Maintenance tools, uh, those are those are provider expenses. Uh, unless you can show that the uh, the tools are used for some kind of hobby for an individual or something like that. Those are some good red flags to look for. 
No car washes if you don't have a car. That's true. That's true. <laughs> no gasoline. No. Yeah. We had one charge a uh, an individual for parking uh, at one of the hospitals because uh, for twenty dollars. And when I challenged it, I said, "Where's the receipt?" They said, "Well, it was a parking ticket I got because he was walking too slow, and my meter expired." So that didn't work out too well. We went for back to school uh, shopping times. Um, you know, that we looked for children's clothes on the receipts for adults, um, office supplies, paper pens, backpacks. Uh, again, it's just real easy for some people to logic out that it's okay to do this. Or maybe they're desperate. Maybe they, they maybe think the, the our PPI on this thing needs the money to cover their own back-to-school costs for the children. We don't know where they're supposed to get the money, but we know where they're not supposed to get the money, and that's from these people we serve. Uh, it comes to gifts. Uh, staff, I, I just can't see that birthday gifts, wedding gifts, Christmas gifts for staff paid out of a certain individual's money. I, didn't, I don't see that, that that's appropriate. They, we get to be friends and we get to caring about each other, the, the ones who are taking care of the individuals. And, and the family even, the, the, the certain individual's family may say, take his money and buy this gift for, for, you know, for yourself or something. And I would say that the family can, certainly can buy gifts for the staff if they want to. But we have a, an employee uh, serve individual relationship here and uh, a nice card is really nice for somebody who has an event in their life uh, rather than a gift card or, or something where they can pull the money out of their accounts. Yeah, we were concerned about the fact that it seems like the misappropriations and uh, they escalate during the back to school times and also right around Christmas and right afterwards. So, you know, if individuals are getting extra money out for gifts for people or buying things for, for themselves around that time, um, then that should be very carefully looked after. I mean, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be like a leeway of three weeks where somebody gets money out and then we don't look for the receipts. That should be fairly quickly spent and accounted for. Um, and not languish out there. We've had instances where the individual's visa card was taken and the provider never asked for it back for three months and lo and behold and they never checked and it was a prepaid one that had 4000 on it and all that money was gone. And it was all because of Christmas and the expenses that we all incur around those times. On the previous slide, we talked about the extravagant gifts. <coughs> Years ago, we had a situation where an elderly mother uh, decided it was a good thing to buy eight $20 gift cards, and she sent birthday gifts out to all their cousins and, and all their aunts and uncles, and she, so she used the serving individual's money for this, and she would put his name on the card also. Uh, so she just bought them every January. She would tell the, the provider, I need these eight $20 gift cards. Well, the guy didn't have very much money, but he, he did he was able to go on outings and stuff, but what was happening then when I did the audit and I, and I said, Well, show me what he got for his birthday. Did he get a lot of gift cards coming in? And the staff goes, No. And I said, Did he get any cards? No. Said, well, he got two, you know, wishing him well. And I that's and I understand this is hard because it was family. It was the mother who wanted to do this, it was a very nice thing to do. But it just was it was a burden on this guy. And he wasn't getting any, any cross benefit from it. There's nothing coming back in. So on that one, we asked him to stop the, the, the nobody went to jail over that, but we, we said that's just not a good practice, okay? And I met with the mother on that one, matter of fact. Uh, staff reimbursements uh, from the personal funds, it's best to avoid that practice. If it must happen, you need more than that one staff member decided it's okay to get twenty bucks back out of their out of their account or out of their cash on hand. You need some management to sign off on it. And uh, uh, that's just, we're not, we're, the, the rule is going to say you're not to loan individuals, staff shouldn't loan individuals, and individuals shouldn't loan staff, and that's what's happening here when they, when they prepay something and they expect to get money back from it. Uh, they need to plan a little better to take more cash. And it may be that what I've heard in the past, while I was out shopping, I knew he would really like this. And first of all, it told me that they didn't have him with them when they decided what he would like. And then the other is that that means there was no management oversight on on an expenditure like that. So that's that could be better. 
And uh, handwritten receipts, sometimes you miss a receipt and you need to drop, you got to have something. And so we tell, my advice is that you, if the providers see that happening, they need to be talking to that staff and only tolerate it for a short period of time to, to say, well, you're going to get in the habit of getting more receipts or you're going to have them write a lot more checks back to us because uh, if no receipt, then the money's got to be replaced. So that, that should, uh, handwritten receipts should be uh, an exception, not the rule. Uh, <laughs> we've even had staff secret living in homes. Uh, they just, there was an extra room and uh, it happened to be a family type business that was doing this thing and they decided, well, this one person, if they're there all the time, and it was a setting where they had to have 24-7 care, but if, you know, if this one person just lives in that back room, they'll always be available for questions and answers and stuff like that. It didn't work out too well for them because we went back and calculated the rent and the portion of the uh, utilities and I even did some food in that one. So that cost that company quite a bit and uh, they figured out that was not a good thing to do. And it certainly violates the rule. It, was, it wasn't like a foster arrangement. It was just something they decided to do on their own. And, and uh, while it was logical, it was bad logic. So, mm -hmm. All right. Staff should not be completing their laundry at the individual's homes either. We've seen a lot of that, and that's water and detergent, and, and plus then they're not doing what they should be for the individuals who they're caring for. When we're looking at um, medication, thefts, um, you know, Jerry had a, a really good point because, you know, there are homes where we count the meds going in and then count them going out, and a lot of times we get, we can catch that person, that, but then there's always that, oh, I forgot to do it, and then the, the meds are actually then taken out and, you know, at, in, and in so many people's hands every week. So it's kind of, it's a good thing, but then that when you've got the medications exposed out and there's chances for thievery due to the fact that people, quote unquote, forget to, to sign. And so we don't, we want to make sure that our the staff are not forgetting to sign for these things too often. I mean, occasionally it's okay, but we don't want that to be going on um, day after day. Um, we had a big medication theft that occurred he, in around central Ohio where an individual was um, <clears throat> getting orthopedic surgery. Um, she actually had two operations and was given oxycodone for the pain. Well, then she changed, um, she moved to a different county and her new FSA took her back to the doctor because she was experiencing pain and it's yet a different joint. And um, so they were going to do surgery on her, but when they went back to the doctor, her old SSA showed up at the appointment. And the individual looked at her and said, what are you doing here? Well, the, the old FSA proceeded to advocate that the individual receive additional pain medication and stronger pain medication. Well, the individual later in that day told somebody that that old SSA of hers from the old county had been stealing her meds. And so the, the county board then contacted the doctor's office and spoke with a nurse who said, oh yes, and she was, she's the SSA for another individual who also needed surgery. Long story short, this staff person had Probably it was over 2,000 pills that she had obtained between the two of them over, it was a significant period of time, a couple years, and those two did not take that many pain medications. They didn't, especially the one did not like the way it made him feel. So when, the doctor's office was also partially at fault for that. But um, we need to have good documentation about when folks are receiving those types of narcotic medications and how they're being used. When we go to pinpoint that PPI, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the, the shorter the time span that we know something was there and something was missing, is it's so much easier because we have less access to, it's only common sense. The number of people are, are 
smaller. The more people we have, or, you know, when somebody's got um, keys made to three houses that are all the same, and this has gone on for the last two years, and we've had, you know, 40 staff people in and out, that's going to be very difficult to determine who came in and took that money. But if we are vigilant and looking at things um, carefully every single month, is what my recommendation is, um, then we are going to have a lot less trouble pinpointing who that is. You know, we all, you know, we are fortunate in this day and age because we've got time, date, location stamps on a lot of our receipts. And we also have um, video cameras and thieves don't really realize that or they might not care, but we have gone back and the police assist with this and we are able to look into who that was that was getting was spending those food stamps, who that was that took those three checks out of the back of the individual's checkbook and went into Home Depot. Well, it wasn't any staff that anybody could recognize, but when the person came out, he got into a van. Well, that just happened to be the van that the staff person drove into work every day. So there are ways for us to look at, at these things and when the staff is scheduled and who had access and all of that. We've got also, you know, when we're talking about the media, social media, we've had cases where uh, individual um, Four individuals were st had money stolen from a staff who was later identified and she had moved away. And she was down in Texas. Well, she happened to owe another staff person money, so they kept in contact on Facebook. Well, it wasn't but two years later and the, the, they, um, she got married to her husband and they posted on their, the uh, Facebook page their address, which was where the reception was. Well, the police had been keeping an eye on all this, and they went and arrested her a couple days later and brought her back up to Ohio. So the social media things are also something that we, we don't encourage people to friend somebody just to figure out whether or not they might have been the uh, person that stole something. But if it's a natural occurrence like that, then um, that's what we want. You know, we use it. We use it to find phone numbers. We use it to find people. We've had people that have bragged on Facebook about winning a poker tournament that they participated in when they, when they should have been watching an individual because they were scheduled to, to take care of somebody that day. And petty cash logs, spot checking, um, you know, we found that there were uh, people need to, the administrators need to watch to make sure that we don't have McDonald's receipts for a time when that individual was at their day program and would not have been out at McDonald's during that time. So, you know, that those are very important things to keep an eye on. And I know it takes time, effort, and energy, and everybody's got so much going on. But when it takes, when when you don't have to pay back thousands of dollars, it, it's well worth the time, effort, and energy for that auditing to take place. I want to go over a little bit about Kohl's cash. Um, you know, there are people that are on the registry now for spending individuals' Kohl's cash. Kohl's ha have um, video cameras, and they also have that cash has got numbers on it, and so they know when it was spent. And people are not allowed to take individuals cold cash and spend it just because it was quote unquote free. It still belongs to that individual. So I kind of wanted to throw that into it too. But the video surveillance and all of the good stuff that we've got going on now has really helped our folks to um, have our P the PPIs identified and the money paid back by that person who actually stole it. Bigger cases? Yeah, let's go yeah. over some of these cases that we Do we have time for the bigger cases? We have a couple of minutes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we've got three of the bigger cases that we've got on the um, 
on the PowerPoint here. You can read the stuff. These are older cases that I worked on. <clears throat> More recent cases, we just last week finished a, a case where the, the provider reimbursed forty four thousand more than forty four thousand dollars last year we had one it was sixty four thousand they that they reimbursed uh, there's been an eighteen thousand dollar one not too long before that uh, this stuff can run into money and this this one you're looking at here this Shane Snuffer guy uh, became the house manager go ahead and hit the next slide please uh, he's he's on year five with twelve and a half year sentence right now um, he, he just did some real hard manipulations and stuff and and you can read about that. Um, he became the local manager at this store, at, the, at our office in Cleveland, for that provider. Go ahead, hit the next one, please. Uh, the next two, they started their own company, or they, uh, they, they were. I think they were accused. They were at least he was qualified, uh, educated and stuff. And then they got into gambling, and they, they, they uh, actually underfoot, underfed the individuals so they could take the food stamp money to. They thought it was more important to be in casinos with their monies than the, these people to have uh, uh, linens back at the group homes and, and uh, adequate food and stuff like that. So he served four years. She did uh, uh, under house arrest and then got some other stuff going. Uh, crime doesn't pay. These guys, uh, they had a big time with it for a while, but then they end up in the big house. And, and I'm sure they weren't, uh, they were frowned upon when they got to that house. This lady was a neighbor who decided to help her other two neighbors out who were impaired. Their dad had left them a $20,000 life insurance policy and they had a home that had $20,000 owing on it, I guess. And the insurance guy, this was his sister, that, that ended up helping them out. And she helped them out plenty. She, 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 uh, we don't know where the $20,000 went. She refinanced the house a couple times. He went to auction for $80,000. This bad person bought that same house and sold it back to the same two ladies and got a refinance two more times. So it was in foreclosure at 117000 when we got involved with the case. And uh, and she also had a business on the side and got two credit cards and maxed those things out. And uh, it didn't work out too well for her. She got four years and, and uh, $650 a month for a long, long time in restitution uh, to be paid back. She's out of prison now. and. Uh, she didn't look that good going in. I'm sure she looked pretty weathered coming out of prison. So she's an entrepreneur, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. All those businesses. Well, I think we got her attention, so that yeah. that'll work out for us. So there's 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 just a quick. You can read those and and look at those, and I think we're. I think we can go over some success stories after Scott's. May we make sure we get through his information, and then if we have time. Hey. Sure, sure. I want to talk just a little bit about prevention planning. And first of all, thank you guys for for all the information. I mean, we you think about theft, and you just maybe don't think about theft in the way we've all described today, and the things that actually can happen. I mean, the bottom line is a lot of the folks we support don't have a lot of money, and um, when people take advantage of our folks, um, you know, it's a travesty, and it really impacts their life. And we talked earlier about the trauma of trusting people, and, and who can you trust? And the simple fact that we're able to do this, and the whole goal of all this stuff is to try to prevent these kind of things from happening. I'll just tell you this, we're getting more people, and I think this is terrific. We're training more and more individuals and families about how to report. We get calls on our own hotline here from individuals who say, somebody's taking my money. We get calls with local boards from families and individuals saying, hey, this isn't right. And that's a lot of times how these things get started. We take a look at what's happening, and the next thing you know, we're able to track down what's happened and, and what's caused individuals' um, concern. I also think that you know, you've got to really monitor and reconcile accounts. You know, Carol mentioned that. Jerry mentioned that. The quicker you're able to find out about what's happening, if you have a good system in place, that's the prevention plan that you need. You're going to find out as soon as something doesn't look right, doesn't smell right, and you're going to be able to get on it right away versus waiting until it's a large amount of money that, that's always happened. So making sure that we follow up as it relates to that. Um, I have to say this. You really have got to monitor everybody within your organization, even the most trusted people. Our good Chuck Davis in the office, you guys have known Chuck a long time. We trust him. But you know what? Sometimes it's that person that you trust the most that knows they can get away with it. And I, I think some of these big cases that we've shared with you, it was somebody that someone said, I don't think there's any way in the world that Jerry or Scott or Carol would take that kind of money. We trust them implicitly. Mm -hmm. You still got to have those checks and balances in place because unfortunately, good people do bad things and get put in bad circumstances and bad situations. And so it's really important that we make sure we're, we're monitoring that. Something else that we don't think about a lot and, and we haven't mentioned yet today, but you know, when people steal money from a person that has a developmental disability, 
it's elevated to a felony offense. And a lot of times people don't know that. A lot of you that have been in training with me before know that my brother's a detective. He says that police officers, detectives, people, prosecutors take felonies a lot more seriously sometimes than other cases. And if you let them know that because they've stolen from a person with a disability, um, it, they really may get better attention. And it can help you with some of those relationships and, and building those relationships with law enforcement and uh, the prosecutor's office. You know, we've gone over a lot of information today. Um, I want to tell you that there's a, a personal service or a personal funds rule that's coming out. It's going to be effective in October. Um, a lot of the information we've talked about today in terms of managing money, assuring people have the money and, and appropriately spending the money that they get, making sure that it happens in a way that makes sense for all providers of service. This personal funds rule is going to be rolled out for all providers of service. It's going to give us a basic ground, ground rules for safeguarding people's uh, funds and safeguarding people's property. So very important that you guys know that. It's all coming out in October. There's going to be a lot more training related to it. That wasn't what this training was about, but I wanted to let you know it dovetails nicely into us sharing information with you about misappropriation in Ohio and what's happening um, to folks. And I know uh, we had some other information we wanted to share real quick. So, okay. Well, we've, we've had a lot of um, cases, as you probably can guess, that where we caught these people after diligently weeding through a lot of paperwork and going to extreme measures and law enforcement subpoenaing um, bank records and also phone records and things that normal investigators, IAs, are not able to get because we're doing an administrative investigation and and uh, they're doing a criminal one if it's law enforcement. So we rely on them in a lot of ways to you know, get that surveillance um, from uh, Walmart or Kohl's or wherever and the bank statement. So we've got, when we work well with them, um, we have a lot of success. And, um, but then there's also the omissions of things that go on due to the fact that there's a staff turnover, not only in the homes, but also in the county board. And um, this one case, this individual moved out of a group home, the home closed, and moved into a new similar, I think it was IO waiver home. And they were having, at her second year um, IST, when she was assigned a new SSA. And the SSA went through her file and suddenly noticed that she had, a, a, her father was worked for the railroad. And there were railroad benefits for her. And no one in that team, even her APSI guardian, knew about these benefits. And so sure enough, they went back and they looked and they were able to determine that the former provider um, the lady that owned the agency was getting the $300 plus dollars um, direct deposited into her checking account for the last two years. And she claimed that she had no knowledge that she was getting that. And now I know if I'm getting $350 extra a month in my checking account, hello, I'm going to know it. So we didn't quite buy that, but um, it, that's just people um, will take what they can if they're of that type of person and so you just have to, you would never believe that some of these folks would do that. Now we have some time for questions. Okay, thanks Carol. Um, one of the questions, and I'll just uh, throw it out to the group and you can answer, if a provider doesn't have ledgers for gift cards, does it let the PPI off the hook because it becomes a systems issue? Well, did the PPI have the receipts for how they use the card? I, th I think it sounds like there's no accounting for the for the gift card usage. It's the providers. Somebody, the providers have to pay the money back. Uh, but did that? Good luck trying to get it back from the from the. Well, them staff if they didn't have a system going. Yeah, right. I think that's what we try to. Yeah, that staff who took that gift card, if they know, should be the one to be to be responsible for those receipts, even if 
there's no system in place. Most every provider agency has rules that talk about receipts, obtaining them if it's for more than what that person's allowance is. They have their spending money, which they may not need receipts for, but other than that, everything else should be receipted. Um, yeah, and someone brought up a really good point that you can also register gift cards online so that the purchases can be tracked that way. Yes. Um, we have time just for one more question, um, and that is if a person that you supervise over here is that you asking a coworker they want to buy a t-shirt that your child is selling, could be Girl Scout cookies, could be a calendar, um, and the individual seems interested in purchasing that, uh, what would you do and does that does that mean that that's misappropriation or anything like that? What would you recommend, Jerry? <laughs> uh, it, usually you're going to pay more than what the t-shirt is worth uh, if they just want a shirt because it has some logo or something on it. Uh, I, 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 would stay, I would stay away from it because it's, uh, it, it's you're, it's, you're going to be suspect for doing it. So, mm -hmm. so like Girl Scout cookies, same thing. You can buy cookies a lot cheaper than Girl Scout cookies. Uh, so I would probably get my cookies somewhere else, but that's just me. Okay. All right. Anyone else have anything to add? I just wanted to say in closing that uh, you know we, we certainly are thankful that you all are, have tuned in today, and obviously misappropriation is a big deal for all of us. I think what Chuck mentioned earlier at the beginning about kind of seeing those numbers kind of peak and maybe even round it off a little does speak to the fact that we all are taking this very serious, providers of service, families, individuals, um, county boards, and certainly the department. And I think, um, you know, the more we report, the more we look into things, the better the outcomes. I think that the scary part is, and Jerry, you can attest to this, seems like the smarter we get and the better we get at investigating, unfortunately, sometimes the smarter and uh, more creative criminals become in, in order of taking money away from folks. But you've heard today a lot of stories about um, people getting caught. You've heard a lot of stories about the situations being captured, and, and I think that sends a message. I mean, I think it's important to send a message. Stealing from the folks that we support um, isn't going to be accepted, and if you make that a, a, a priority in your agency, if you make that a priority as an independent provider, if we make that priority as a state, I think we're going to do a, go a long way in, in protecting money and property of the folks we support in Ohio. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in closing, there's um, the contact information for the presenters here. If we did not have time to answer your questions, we will uh, send you an email after uh, this webinar. Expect to see your certificate within 30 days of this webinar, and we will also be posting this taped webinar on um, our website probably within the next couple of weeks. So we want to thank you for your time and attention today. And thank you for the good work you do every day. And um, enjoy your afternoon. Goodbye.